Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, May 24th, 2022, Long-Term Financial Stability, Key Performance Indicators Update, and Mid-Cycle Budget Workshop. Roll call, please, Madam Secretary. Director Coleman? Present. Director Katz? Present. Director McIntosh? Here. Director Mellon? Present. Director Patterson? Present. Director Young? I'm here. President Lenny? Here. <clears throat> if members of the public are online and wish to speak uh, during our public comment period on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature and Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard at the beginning of the workshop. Comments on the workshop presentation will be heard at the end of the presentation. When prompted, please state your name, affiliation, and if applicable, uh, if applicable, and topic. Please refrain from providing personal information during public comment. If we need this information, we'll have you contact staff. The secretary will call each speaker in the order received. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to speak. Uh, however, I have the discretion to amend this time based on the number of speakers. Uh, the secretary will keep track of time and inform each speaker when the allotted time has concluded. Do we have any speakers? We have no speakers online. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning, President Lenny and board members. So for today's workshop, we'll discuss updates to our key performance indicators in our strategic plan and present our fiscal year 22 and 23 mid-cycle budget including proposed fiscal year 23 rates, charges, fees, and regulations not subject to Proposition 218. The key performance indicators are updated every other year and reflect our proposed changes for fiscal years 23 and 24. The presentation you'll see is a summary of the major changes to the KPIs and a copy of the full red line version is in your board packet. Uh, the fiscal year 22-23 mid-cycle budget update includes our proposed drought budget, which we shared with you at the last board meeting, proposed staffing changes, and changes to our rates, charges, and fees. Uh, the board will be asked to affirm the amended fiscal year 23 budget at the June 14th board meeting. Uh, and with that introduction, I'd like to pass it on to our finance director, Sophia Skoda, to begin the workshop. Thank you. Um, as I begin, I just would like to say thank you to um, the entire budget team who uh, worked very hard on putting this presentation together. We had the departure of our very long time uh, budget manager, Jean Chase, and um, in December. And so thank you also to Sue Liga and to Samuel Feldman, who took over as um, in a temporary capacity um, and led that team as they were developing this. Um, we have made a permanent selection for the budget manager position, and Samuel Feldman um, is the permanent budget manager. Congratulations, um, Samuel. And you'll be hearing from Sam um, as we uh, move forward this morning with the workshop. Okay. So I'll just briefly now go over the agenda after an introduction and um, uh, an update to the KPIs as Clifford described. We'll go over the mid-cycle budget update. So this is based on nine months of the year. Um, uh, we gave you the six months um, relatively recently um, and so you'll, you'll hear kind of where we expect to be at this point. So that will all be Samuel. After the break, you're going to hear from Richard Liu on the non-218 rates, charges, and fees, and also from me on a couple of other items, including the workshop summary and next steps. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it to our new budget manager, Sam. Thank you, Sophia, and members of the board. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to start on the KPI and strategic plan updates as the first item, and as uh, General Manager Chan mentioned, the full red line version is available in your packet. And as you know, the strategic plan is a document that lays out the district's goals in six key areas shown on the screen there. And uh, comprehensive updates to this plan are made as needed to ensure alignment to the board's priorities. The last update to the strategic plan and its KPIs uh, was in 2020. And the proposed update this year, as we've talked about, is to the key performance indicators, or KPIs, as I'll refer to it. And they, uh, they, the KPIs are meant to demonstrate progress towards meeting the goals and strategies contained in the strategic plan. And so this is the, uh, as, as I mentioned, we're focusing on the key performance indicators. This is what the cover uh, will look like once we are published. 
And uh, it, in the board packet, as I mentioned, is the red line version, uh, and you can see all of the changes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, in the next couple of slides, go over the major substantive changes uh, or notable changes that we are recommending. Uh, there are a lot of smaller changes, like in, in many places, changing the percent symbol to the word percent just to match a, a style thing. And uh, so mostly we're going to be focusing on the sort of notable changes here. So for the goal long-term water supply, uh, again, there are some uh, small changes, but the updates are primarily reflecting continued progress to uh, up, uh, um, Sam, yes. could you, um, if uh, you may not have the capacity to do so, but if you can refer us to what page of the red line you're on when you're going, that would be helpful. Yeah. Just because okay. it, it's a lot of pages. It is a lot of pages. <clears throat> I think I will be able to do that. So we're starting about on page five. Uh, starts with sort of this picture. I've got it in black and white here, but um, if that helps yeah. at all. So page five, this is laying out the goal and the strategies. And then, um, make sure I'm going to be flipping the right way here. OK. And then, uh, so you can see on the next page, six and seven, just one of the things to note uh, that, that the formatting doesn't look quite right when you look at the red line version, that it, it'll all, it cleans up once you remove the red lines and it's in the final version. So you'll see, for example, just, uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail in this version, uh, that the, the first sub bullet I have on the screen is uh, we at, that uh, we're recommending adding work with Placer Counter, County Water Agency to publish a draft environmental document for long-term water transfer. You can see that's underlined and added, and then there's, uh, we didn't mention that it's complete the environmental document for long-term water transfer, because this is just, uh, what I'll be going over is mostly the major changes we're making here. And uh, you'll see there's some other uh, smaller changes on six, and there's a little more detail on Los Vaqueros, for example, by the time you get to the end of six. Sort of in the middle there, you'll notice uh, the uh, Operate the Dream Project, uh, Dream Pilot Project in San Joaquin County, and Compile Lessons Learned is, is a bit of a iterative update of what was already there, which is a theme throughout. And then as we get towards seven, you'll notice that uh, the, I think we're really getting into maybe, uh, yeah, top of seven, uh, updating the goal for the uh, uh, 70 million gallon day savings from conservation programs with the baseline year of 1995. That uh, has changed from 48.4 in a prior uh, version in prior year uh, to now 50 and then 50.8 in fiscal 24. And then there's another, the other substantive change here is towards the bottom of seven, uh, completing the hydraulic analysis and preliminary design of the future Emeryville to Albany pipeline and begin environmental uh, documentation, and then sort of a follow-up item in fiscal 24. Those are sort of the major changes for long-term water supply. I'm going to keep going unless there are any concerns there. Okay. So then uh, on slide five is a summary of the next uh, three uh, goals, uh, changes to these, because there were some smaller changes that needed summarized. So if you're on page 10 of the uh, red line version in the board packet, you'll see a lot of changes here are uh, just updating wording. The, the, the KPI itself hasn't changed. Right in the middle of the page is you'll see an update to the uh, both the text on the left side uh, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, GHG, and you also see the goals have changed as well for 23 and 24. And the uh, left side reflects the energy policy approved by the board and the exact wording from that. And then the right side are the sort of uh, CO2 equivalent, that's CO2E, uh, KPI for 23 and 24. And so that is the, that's sort of the main uh, Notable change you'll see in water quality and environmental protection. If you go to 11, you'll see the goal and strategy for long-term infrastructure investment. And on page 12 are the red line uh, small changes. 
And you'll note that the uh, most notable change here is that uh, um, under the sort of three from the bottom, implement or endo water treatment plant disinfection improvements, you'll see it's continued construction or report annually in fall. These are sort of iterative um, uh, changes there. And then also there are uh, some items. Uh, there, there's a new uh, replacement for the main wastewater treatment administrative facility, seismic retrofit, right above it, completing design and then completing construction. In long-term financial stability, again, primarily changes are uh, about cleaning up or uh, phrases or style. And the biggest changes are aligning some of the cybersecurity items to the cybersecurity controls 20 IG2 improvement plan in 20, uh, fiscal year 23, and then the IG3 improvement plan in fiscal year 24. So just sort of bringing those KPIs in alignment to the plans uh, for cybersecurity. Next on page uh, 15 is the uh, goal for customer and community services and strategies underneath. And then changes in this section on 16 and 17, and yep, just 16, 17, you'll note uh, a lot of sort of change and move around and it looks a lot better in a final version than in the red line, sort of some of that formatting there. But for the most part, uh, the changes are formatting. Uh, so you see quite a bit of redlining, but a lot is formatting of words. But there are some other notable changes uh, I want to point out that for the customer opinion survey, which is uh, sort of in, under strategy two customer satisfaction, the second one down, that is uh, uh, proposing a change to conduct research and evaluate outreach methods in fiscal year 23. Another notable item uh, to reflect board priorities and the, the direction from the board over the prior years is changing uh, item. It is it actually moved as well, so it's a little harder to find, but um, it is on the top of page 17 and moved from towards the bottom of 16 to the top of 17, that instead of saying notice customer, notify customers in advance of shutoff for non-payment, it is now notify customers in advance of service interruption for non-payment. That's reflecting changes to district regulations. And there's some other sort of minor changes here and there on uh, alternative shutoff program and customer assistance. Uh, you know, there's uh, an item right below that about continue to address COVID impacts with board guidance and implement alternative to shutoff program after the health emergency orders send it. Yeah, Director. Um, yeah, uh, the, <clears throat> our, our decision to end customer shutoffs um, coincided with COVID, but but they're they're just adjacent to each other. They're not. I mean, it, it, one might sadly will probably still be dealing with COVID throughout FY twenty three, but um, it 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 does feel like we want to not link. Uh, they shouldn't be linked. Um, I, I, in my uh, opinion, um, since we're going to continue, uh, you know, this policy, and we w probably would have implemented this policy regardless of COVID, it just gave us a point in time to do so. Um, so just a comment there, or question and comment. I mean, first, am I right? And second, um, you know, th is there some massaging to do with that? Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's not linked directly to it. I mean, I, I think the board's aware that the government. I mean, the shutoff moratorium ended last December, but we've continued to suspend it. Our plan is to um, start messaging to our customers later this year that we're going to be moving towards the full restrictors that they don't pay, and then at the beginning of the next year, we'd be implementing that that plan for those customers who aren't paying their bills, we're not going to shut them off, but we would install the flow restrictors. So we're taking an additional year, even though the moratorium is shut, to really do the outreach that we had talked to the board about, that our customers are aware that's going to be coming. Um, and, uh, you know, Andrew Lee and his staff will be working on that. So if there's any kind of sense of a linkage, we'll make sure that we separate that. Okay. Thank you. Great, and I, I think that was the end of my summary for customer and community services.
section. So on to seven, workforce planning and development, I'm sorry, uh, slide seven, we're on page 19 with the goal and strategy, in, uh, strategies in this area, and on page 20 is the red line version uh, of these goals, and the notable changes here are... Why up didn't get those? Oh, Could you try? Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I understand myself, so that's good. Um, so uh, uh, you'll note that there's changes in the first strategy there for the diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion strategic plan, and the targets for 23 and 24 are completing. The report on all four first year actions in the two year action plan for 23, and then uh, it makes sense that the second year, uh, 24, is about the second year actions in the two year action plan. There's also a new uh, item here, uh, a new KPI related to ensuring employees complete all required training in addition to the KPI that's maintaining uh, or staying there about the average training hours per employee. So, please. When will we have, be able to comment on these items? Now or is it going to come up later? You can comment now if you like. This was an item that I raised and um, it's not getting to the point of what the intent was. I know that for the attorneys, they have to have constant legal training in order to keep their uh, license. Same for engineers. They have to have constant training and certification to keep their license. Um, my gist of this is in other departments, and I'll be blunt, uh, HR, which I believe in the past has, not, has run amok. I'll leave it at that. When people are employees, regardless of who they are, are being told something by HR and then finding out later, oh, we made a mistake, so to speak, and they are not kept up on current HR rules of the state, uh, our retirement system, CalPERS, that there needs to be a measurement there are the people who are doing this and are advising employees, regardless of who the employee is, that they are trained and certified because what has gone on in the past is inexcusable, quite frankly, and this does not get to it. So I'd like to see how we can change that. I, somebody who is in HR, who's giving advice, should have up-to-date, adequate training and certification, and that hasn't been the past case. I don't think it's the case now. And... Uh, needs to be addressed. So um, thank you, Director Coleman. And so just a couple of things just for the board to understand. First, why we made the change, and I'll have Winnie here to address your comment, Director Coleman. But you know, originally it was just provide training for 30 hours a year for employees, but that included required training, like required safety training. And because this was under employee development, you know, I wanted to separate the two, saying there's required training that you have to take, and then there's an additional 30 hours for your development. And so, you know, really want to separate the, I have to take training versus training for your employee de development. Directly to your comment, Director Coleman, um, I had a chance to talk to Winnie yesterday and you know, Winnie can respond and, and provide some suggestions. Good morning, directors. So um, I went back to about uh, over the past 10 years of the trainings that we have done in HR and all our groups, in police services, recruitment, retirement, HRS, um, em employee relations. And so um, we have tried and continued to be able to support training for our employees. Well, there are specific trainings um, that we want. Uh, we, there was a pause for the last two and a half years at least, but we have been sending one analyst through to uh, CalPERS, uh, trainings. Uh, we have sent employees to uh, the Nas National Association of Government Deferred Contribution Administrators, but we've only sent one. And I think um, we believe that HR as a whole, because we work in tandem and we work in, as a team, you know, our techs and clerks uh, should benefit from this type of training because they would probably be the most 
first person you're interacting with. And so we're recommending uh, as a KPI that the, our techs and clerks for sure um, go through an average of eight to 10 hours of training per year. And then our analysts who are overseeing and supporting and supervising the techs and clerks and also probably the subject matter experts, um, an average of 24 to maybe 48 hours, depending on the type of training. Now, certification, some places do offer a certificate, and, um, and but the reality is the continuous knowledge, gain, you know, gaining knowledge, being um, knowledgeable, the changes with the laws. Uh, we go through a lot of trainings with law firms, but because our budget at times is a little limited of how many people we can send, um, this type of support would be really helpful to make sure that our HR team uh, from every level has sufficient training to, be, you know, to respond um, appropriately and correctly to concerns. Well, having watched what's gone on, it's inadequate and it has life-changing impacts for some people who are employees. That is not right. And there needs to be a system of checks and balances so that any employee who's getting guidance from HR can trust what they're told and not to be told later, sorry, we made a mistake. And this isn't sufficient for me. So I'd like to see what else can be tightened up on this. So beyond what Winnie is proposing? Yeah, because it's, it's, I, when was the last time anybody did the CalPERS training? I believe the recent CalPERS training, Valerie, went. When? Uh, I, I will find out, sir. Well, I'd like to find out exactly in writing what you're looking at doing. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Where do you have, when you have employees um, who report for their regular evaluation and they have some areas that the supervisor has concern about, at what point do you connect that part in so that they get assistance with where they may be lacking? before the annual evaluation comes up. Especially by pills. So employees have one-on-ones with their supervisors almost uh, on a weekly basis, even bi-weekly basis. We also have mid-year appraisals that occur before the annual to evaluate and see the progress. But in reality, they have monthly team meetings to check in, uh, have a round table, have, uh, you know, have employees kind of respond and share challenges they're um, facing so that we can problem solve together. So evaluations and appraisals are done on a constant basis, formally twice a year, but in reality they are being trained and, uh, and with oversight on a weekly basis. I meet with my team every week. Uh, I know that our managers have meet regularly with their team every week of who they supervise and, and, and it trickles down in that way. Yeah. And, and as far as, Director Patterson, as far as the KPIs in the plan, I mean, uh, within the, um, the strategic plan, we have KPIs for that the, uh, the, the performance appraisals and plans are done on time. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's how we capture it at this higher level document. Okay. Thank you. I'll leave it open. Any other, that, that is the workforce planning is the last section and the last part of the KPI update, strategic plan update for this workshop today. Are there any other questions or comments on the document? I uh, was interested in some other examples of training uh, across the district. I think we, we had a good exchange about uh, human resources, but I'm interested in what, what might happen for our pipeline crews, our uh, wastewater workers, our um, just other other kinds of classifications that uh, where where training might be uh, so obvious, um, and um, how we would evaluate deviating from the average. Um, you know, thirty hours does approach about a week time off task, um, and that may be. Um, really important for certain uh, employees at the, at the junior level or who are being assigned a new skill. Um, I would recognize that team building 
um, and leadership skills development, collaboration, you know, those, those sorts of work life skills. Um, are, those, that's training and that helps create a more effective workforce. Um, but I am, I'm just interested in some more examples of what, what training um, uh, we employ. So what we can do, we'll, we'll summarize in detail all the, the various trainings that we're thinking about. A lot of the trainings are highlighted in the diversity and inclusion mass, a strategic plan. Um, but some of the trainings too that we're talking about are the, the mass training. So it's, it's for management training, but it's actually open to all employees. Other things that we're going to be starting up again are our lead and pathways and management leadership academy. So really to get line staff to first level foremen or supervisors and then for supervisors to get to the next level superintendent and then the management leadership to get people up in the management. So these are training programs that we'll be starting up again. Those that participate in those programs and there's some in this room that participate in that program, um, you know, that would be well beyond the 30 hours that somebody would, would be getting. So we'll summarize all the different types of trainings just so you can get a, a full picture of what we're, what we're offering. Thank you. You know, just if I can add on, you know, there's uh, often the memberships or organizations we belong to provide training as well, often at a deep discount as well. So I, uh, the budget office together took a training on diversity, equity, and budget process, and how do you incorporate those? And I think that was a, it was a two-hour session, an hour and two-hour session that we all attended, and it was very useful for us. So there's a lot of things that come up presented by GFOA, the, the Government Finance Officers Association, and they... Uh, it was, a, it was a great training for us to start thinking about and help fulfill part of the two-year action plan for the um, DEI strategic plan. So it's good. Um, I have another question on this um, strategy four. Um, and again, I don't, th this isn't the right, potentially right venue to have that discussion, but, um, you know, we continue to use the word minorities to describe um, people of color um, or people of other, um, you know, sort of ethnic <clears throat> um, backgrounds that are not white. Um, and I just, you know, it seems to me an appropriate area of discussion to better, because minority con continues the, um, a racist structure um, that assumes white is better, white is majority, et cetera. And um, so I, I, I understand that part of that is established legal structural stuff, but I, I, I just, you know, want to raise, throw that, I don't see dairy, so <laughs> just sort of throw that out as something to think about down the road. I don't know that we need it's probably a bigger discussion. I don't think we need to have it now, but yeah. and, and where we can it. yeah, and where we can start with that discussion next month, we provide another update on the the plan to the ledge HR committee. So we'll bring it up then. Okay. Okay. I think we're ready to move on. So. Uh, we're going to move to the uh, mid-cycle budget update uh, next on the schedule here. And uh, I, I'm going to go through, uh, this is a little bit of a re-agenda slide. So we're going to talk about our fiscal year 22 projections, the current fiscal year ending June 30. Uh, so just about uh, 40 days away or so. And uh, we'll talk about staffing changes. And then we're going to talk about water and wastewater revenues, expenses, and water sales, uh, as well as drought, all as part of this update. And so first, we start off with the year-end projections. So uh, we're looking at the water system here. And as Sophia had mentioned earlier, this, is, this projection is based on the nine months, the first nine months of the year. Now, the semi-annual presented to you recently was the first six months of the year. So we use those nine or six months uh, nine months now as a, uh, to predict what the final three months will be. And uh, in the end, this is a, a fairly minor update since we talked about it in the semi-annual update. There a uh, slight revision up in total revenue expectations, uh, primarily or almost entirely due to uh, SEC revenues uh, increasing by year end. And then the expense uh, overall did not change significantly the projections there. Um, however, there are some slight changes just in the uh, where we think expenses will end in terms of drought and uh, the operations line item as well. 
debt service and capital support, not a significant change there. In general, for both water and wastewater, uh, really, there are some key drivers that are uh, driving expenses, uh, our expectation that expenses will end uh, at the full budget or just below. One is the recently settled labor agreements, uh, certainly uh, were higher than expectations in terms of uh, GSI and other uh, related expenses. Two, of course, drought in the current fiscal year ending June 30, there was uh, no appropriation for drought. And so there, those expenses are above uh, the typical budget. And then COVID uh, continues to be a source of higher than expected expenditures. Um, based on something I saw recently, we spent at least 2.2 million this year on testing and tracing and other uh, services like that. So it's, a, it's quite an expense for us compared to uh, if we didn't have to spend that. And then finally, inflation. The thing you hear a lot about in the news is affecting the district and our expenses, uh, particularly for energy and chemical costs. You know, for example, anecdotally, uh, it, it's not much of a data point uh, as a proof of anything, but anecdotally, some of these chemical costs individually are going up 60%, 40 to 60%. Others are in the more typical range of 2 to 4%, but there are some just uh, remarkable increases, particularly, I think, supply chain related to Ukraine is what I've heard as well. So uh, that is really driving up expenses this year, and we're expecting to end the year just under budget in terms of expenses. For the water system and then for wastewater very similar uh, 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 situation as well that that SEC revenue is increased since our last projection we expect it to be slightly over budget or quite a bit on a percentage basis but by dollar amount uh, uh, is not very significant and then expenses on the same uh, uh, for the water system pressured by the same factors COVID uh, recently settled labor agreements inflation energy chemical costs uh, all of the things I mentioned as well. So we expect to end under budget for operating expenses, slightly above budget for total revenues. So that's fiscal 22. Next to, as a lead into the fiscal 23, we're gonna talk about staffing changes in uh, fiscal 23, what will be recommended to you uh, as the board on June 14th. Just as a note, as we start to enter the fiscal 23 discussion here, uh, this workshop is to uh, provide discussion opportunity for the fiscal 23 budget and uh, as well as the staffing changes. These will be brought to the board for formal action on June 14th, uh, so a couple weeks from now. Uh, but we wanted to talk to them, talk about them in detail here. So in terms of staffing changes, uh, there was one item that was already approved in the fiscal 23 budget, and that is a, 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 a position that we're deleting. It should say negative one FTE, I think. And it's not going to be funded in fiscal 23. The, it's a limited term human resources technician that expires this month. And it's not funded in 23, so it will be deleted by the board. And it was added uh, in December 2017 to address increased HR baseline work. And so it's no longer needed. It will be removed. And then in terms of requests for fiscal 23, uh, excluding drought. Drought is on the next slide. We'll talk about it a little more specifically. There are some recommend, uh, recommendations here. And first, there are, is a recommendation to delete two positions, administrative clerk TCs, that uh, the project has ended. It was a lead tap project. And so we're recommending deleting those two. There's also converting a temp position to a regular position in uh, public related to public records. And it's the job classification as a senior admin clerk confidential, and that is the net effect of that is a uh, half increase in FTE. Uh, all of these, by the way, are on the water side. Uh, and then there are, uh, the rest of these are all uh, items related to ODAC, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Culture, as we've talked about in the KPIs, and as the board has talked about, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan is a big priority for the board and for the district as a whole, and so these recommendations or these actions or these items are all part of adding resources to ODEX so they can continue to implement the uh, plan approved by the board. So one of them is converting an LT to a regular position. Senior human resources analyst has no uh, net effect on FTEs. And then there are uh, two uh, recommendations to add positions, uh, both for ODEC executive assistant two to support the 
uh, division, as well as a senior human resource analyst to do substantive work as well. Uh, both positions really do substantive work. And then finally, just to note here, so those are those combined are a net two FTE. And then finally, we added this just, there's no action needed by the board. Uh, this item was part of the uh, authority already given to the general manager to transfer and reallocate positions. And uh, the uh, budget office actually in finance is giving up a position to ODEC uh, so they can have a community affairs representative one, two, so flex between those two positions. So there's no change in net FTEs there, uh, but we thought we would let the board know this is another part of the plan to give them the resources they need to do their work. And so just, just to be clear, thank you, Sam. So for those four positions, I know this is a question that's routinely asked by the board is, what resources does uh, you know, Derry and the office need? Now that the strategic plan is completed, um, we identify that there is some additional need to you know, make this program successful. And, and these positions are related to support staff as well as support the contract equity program and then provide overall administrative and analytical support for that department. So that's why we're bringing forward these proposed changes. And so the net change of all of these is a plus half FTE for 23. And then when we look at uh, the drought staffing side, uh, there is, uh, so as you may know already, there are 12 limited term drought positions in the staffing plan. These 12 positions in total are only eligible to be filled during declared water shortage emergencies. And uh, of those 12, there's seven there on the top table that will be activated as of July 1st, 2022. So the, as of the start of fiscal year 23, and it's four customer service reps, two water conservation technicians, and one field services rep. These four positions will support the water shortage uh, emergency action plan and other drought related actions. You know, customer service reps, for example, there are there's typically been an increase in calls uh, as part of the uh, drought surcharges and other items uh, as people start to receive more mail and uh, notifications about droughts and water usage. And then water conservation tech and field services rep, uh, work in the field to help reduce water use as well. Um, Sam, do, um, the or Andrew, are we recruiting now or Winnie? Are we recruiting now for all of these positions? We have. Okay, so we're we'll. We'll have people in seats on July 1st or as close to that as we possibly can. Right. We hope to get them in seats now. Okay. Because it feels like this, you know, July to September or October is like the critical time and got to train people and all of that. It, we're talking about really August and so, okay. Thank you. Yeah. We sort of, we let them start the hiring process, but they, they can fill the position as of July, it's, I think July 4th is the first pay period of that fiscal year. Yeah. And then, uh, so those are the seven positions. There are then uh, three others that are not already in the staffing plan. And we are recommending, uh, we will be recommending June 14th that the board add these to the staffing plan. And then we will, uh, if the board approves, allow them to fill two of these three. So these are for public affairs office. Right now there are no limited term drought positions for public affairs. And uh, sort of a, a, it's an interesting legacy of when we added these limited term positions, there just weren't added any for public affairs. So we're recommending adding these three, and then two of them, uh, if, if approved by the board, would be filled uh, after that. So there'd be one of the PIRs, public information rep, one twos, and then one community affairs rep. And so those, those the top items there, don't really require board action because they're already part of the staffing plan, but approval of the drought contingency budget will fund those plans. Uh, will, oh, I'm sorry, will fund those positions. And then the uh, bottom items are new additions to the staffing plan that will be recommended June 14th. Okay. And then final update on the staffing plan are some uh, pay and equity uh, modifications in uh, fiscal year 23. And so the first, uh, the first item is the, uh, we just wanted to note that 72 positions as part of the MOUs were 
uh, uh, part of equity increases and the total cost increase expected for fiscal year 23 is 472,000. And then there are three other uh, classes uh, of physicians that will be uh, part of fiscal year 23 expenses and uh, one of them pending continued discussion and an updated job description. So the heavy equipment operator, 56 positions affected total cost, 260,000 expected. There's some management equities uh, as well. Nine positions will be affected for that total cost of 173. And then finally, a new classification water reclamation operator uh, would be seven positions, and that is the total cost there compared to existing similar positions. And so that is the staffing plan update. Any questions on staffing? Okay, great. So uh, we're moving to the fiscal 23 budget, which would start July 1st, 2022 and go to June 30th, uh, 2023. And this is uh, because we're at the mid cycle where the midway in between the budget uh, that was approved in uh, June, 2021. So we're wrapping up the first year of that biennial budget uh, soon and the second year will start July 1st. So this is what was already approved by the board back in June, 2021 for fiscal year 23 for the water system on the left, the wastewater system on the right numbered columns just to sort of anchor you to where we are. And first we'll talk about the water system. On the water system, in terms of operations, line items, I'm just gonna go back real quick. I'm generally gonna be talking about operating debt service and capital line items here. So on the operating system, when we talk about baseline operating expenses, they're expected to be manageable within the budget already approved for fiscal year 23. And there's some enhanced caution this year, although responsible stewardship of public funds will continue to be expected. And uh, that, you know, this will not sound unfamiliar from what I was talking about earlier, that there are some uh, big increases we've seen already in terms of uh, inflationary increases to energy, chemical costs, I haven't mentioned yet, but you'll hear me talk about paper costs have also gone up as well. Um, if you, I, I noticed this at grocery stores, they weren't even offering paper bags for a couple of weeks. I think supply chain just uh, really um, interfered with the paper delivery. And so uh, interesting thing to happen to costs for uh, the district as well. And so that, that kind of thing is what's driving our enhanced caution here for uh, the water system op baseline operating expenses for next year. In addition to labor costs compared to budget projections, though uh, offset by vacancy savings in our projection. In terms of the debt service line item, uh, it's expected to be manageable within the budget for fiscal year 23. There is a proposal that we're evaluating and thinking about before bringing to the board for action later in the uh, calendar year, maybe August or September or so, to uh, uh, call 14.3 million just about in water 2012B bonds for debt service savings. So it could produce significant savings and with rising interest rates in particular, it may be a good idea to cash fund that uh, to Feasel or that call. So the board, we would uh, likely need board authority to uh, for that. So we will, we're continuing to evaluate it. Treasury division is, and uh, if it's affordable in fiscal year 23 using reserves, they'll come back to the board for approval on that. And then just in terms of setting expectations for the water system, because of rising interest rates, our commercial paper interest costs, our variable rate debt, have uh, risen rapidly and expected to continue to rise. Uh, you know, three months ago we were getting. Uh, 0.1% interest. Now we're getting about 1.2% interest for 90 days. So pretty significant cost increase for, uh, within a several months. And there is contingency in the debt budget uh, to uh, that if if the commercial paper interest costs rise above what was budgeted, uh, there is some funds there that may mean reducing how much we pay down of the commercial paper program in fiscal 23, but uh, isn't expected to um, significantly harm the budget for debt. And then when we look at capital, it remains sufficient for 23. There are some, uh, as the board has heard and talked about, there's substantial increases in large project costs, and that's expected to be covered by appropriation transfers from other projects as needed. And part of the continued discussion with the board is evaluating the capital plan, capital planning model, and further options and discussion will happen throughout the next year and as part of the fiscal year 24-25 biennial budget process. 
But for now, capital appropriations remain sufficient. And then when we talk about drought is uh, the sort of next part of this, that uh, when I started off the water system, we did not have an appropriation for drought in fiscal 23 already approved. Um, but there is, uh, as you've heard over the past several months, and the board has taken many actions related to this, there is expected to be a significant impact on fiscal 23 revenues and expenses, which we'll be talking about. And uh, it, the board has already approved an 8% stage two drought surcharge. If it's implemented for the full fiscal 23, it's expected to uh, lead to 30.8 million in revenue. And the drought surcharge, uh, just as a note, is linked to the cost of service uh, study and establishing a drought budget. So when we look at the drought budget here, this is from a, an appropriation uh, perspective. So the drought contingency budget, which you'll see in a minute is what will be recommended June 14th uh, to be uh, to amend the fiscal 23 budget to include this. So it's sort of broken into two sections here, which is supplemental supply up top for a total cost of 31.4 million uh, proposed. That includes both purchasing supplemental supply. So that first line item is really related to about 40,000 acre feet uh, it, the, at a cost of all told about $550 per acre foot. Uh, but that's really a estimate or a blended rate based on a couple different sources, potential sources uh, that are fairly secure or uh, uh, are, are less contingent at this point. They're either under contract or expected to be under contract, though always dependent on water conditions. And storage and treatment costs there, 4 million are the expected expenses on the East Bay Mud side for the water delivered. And then that additional source line is uh, part of a contingency for other sources that could uh, become available throughout the year. In terms of the customer support outreach, uh, there are a couple of small line items there that add up to 1.9 million for outreach, printing. As I mentioned, paper cost, uh, one item there, it's 0 0.2, but it's 150,000, is a printing contingency due to the supply chain uh, this is for brochures, bills, notices, that kind of thing. Costs have increased uh, quite a bit for printing. So we're adding that contingency in as well in case it's needed. And then you'll see the first two line items are the limited term staffing as I talked about. So with that, you'll now see for uh, uh, on slide 26, the approved water system budget, which is already approved, and then the recommended budget, which will come to the board on June 14th, includes that drought contingency line item. And this is typically uh, how it is shown in the board resolution that it is a separate uh, line item after the baseline. So there's no change really to the, to the top side, the baseline, but there is the addition of the drought contingency budget is the recommendation. So that's it for water system. If there aren't any questions, we'll go to wastewater. Here's a reminder is the approved fiscal year 23 budget appropriation as approved last year, last June. We talk about operating expenses very similar to the water system uh, and labor costs, chemicals, energy, biosolids as well. And additionally, there are some increased legal expenses continuing from fiscal year 22, uh, but otherwise uh, should remain within the budget for fiscal 23 on the operating side, uh, continued caution, of course, of uh, public funds will be expected. On the debt service side, we're looking at uh, debt service expenses that are expected to be manageable within budget for fiscal 23. As of last week, there is 8 million in expendable commercial paper left for the wastewater system. That is the last piece of variable rate uh, exposure for the wastewater system in terms of debt. And it's down from 15 million just a couple of years ago. As I mentioned on the water side, the uh, interest costs are rising pretty rapidly and they're rising a little bit more for the extendable commercial paper. And so one part of the evaluation over the next couple of months will be a proposal uh, to pay down that final 8 million using reserves. It's getting to just about the size where that's within reach. So it, it could produce material savings heading into the biennial 24-25, and it could be a, a responsible way to reduce interest costs as well and allow for affordable funding of capital using rate revenue and debt for the wastewater system. But that'll come to the board in the future, not part of the budget uh, uh, recommendation today. 
And then capital appropriations, same here, uh, except to note that there are three emergencies in fiscal 22, and that's just a further emphasis uh, uh, that we need to continue the infrastructure renewal replacement uh, for wastewater, and that's a big part of the capital program, the main driver of it. And uh, appropriations cash flow expected to remain sufficient in fiscal year 23, and uh, we continue to evaluate for 24 and 25 over the next year. And that leads to the summary for the wastewater system here of total expenses, no change, uh, no recommended change for wastewater for fiscal year 23 at this point. And so that finally wastewater water system lined up next to each other. The one change is in purple there, 33.3 million for drought contingency for the water system. Sorry. Please. Please. <laughs> no? I, this, um, the, the phrase offset by vacancy savings raises some question marks for me because, I mean, vacancies happen for different reasons. People leave because they find another job, people retire. But that's something you can kind of look ahead, but it's not our, it's not in our control. And so when we think about needs that we have, um, you know, some vac the, the idea that we that we handle this the increased labor costs solely by vacancy savings, um, when in reality, what I mean, I think what we need to do is figure out what does this vacancy cause us to have a material need that we have to fill right away, or or is it just like okay, well, we're just going to slide for a while? I just I'm having a little. Thanks. Sure. So, um, y you know, there there would be, you know, we do plan, we, when we make our, our financial plans and we put it into the rates, we kind of look historically and we trend to see, like, how long has it taken to fill sure. positions um, in certain periods of time. We have either more or fewer retirees, like around 2010, people started to be a little conservative. They weren't sure what was going on with the economy. People weren't really retiring. We haven't seen a kind of reverse trend recently. So. We, we want to make sure to include some level because otherwise we're raising rates more than we have to for yeah, customers. Yeah, yeah. And so, so we're trying to balance those things, but we're not, I mean, there's been no time in any recent year where we have told someone don't fill that position because, you know, we need it for budget savings. So we're just saying in this particular case, you know, thankfully, you know, we do have those savings and so we're, we're using it, but there's been no, no recent time when we've done that. There have been times you know, again, around, I think, 2009, 2010, when, um, you know, people were told, like, don't, don't fill positions right now. But that's not been... been okay, so this yeah. isn't, it isn't a new strategy, it isn't right. a, a more... It's not a strategy. Yeah, it's just, it's just reflective of the current reality of yeah. where okay. the savings are coming from, but we are not holding positions yeah. to help okay, those, cover the costs. To say those costs are set, are offset by... They happen to be our offset. ...our stand by yeah. the vacancy rate that we assume in the budget, so we're okay... It's like, it, yeah, it, it, like not only what we assume in the budget, but the reality. That, so this is, you know, we're, we're, we're really reflecting kind of what have we seen this last year? And then that helps us kind of sharpen our pencils as we go into the next year and look at, you know, hey, are we going to be okay? We know things, expenses have gone up more than we had assumed. Labor is going to be more. But guess what? You know, we actually have seen more retirements and so on than we had budgeted. And so right, every and time now we, we might start seeing yeah. less retirements because of inflation. Right. Because people right. are seeing their 401k. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that's a, that's a good, good point. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. So. With that, I think we're moving to revenue projections and then unless any other questions on sort of appropriation or expenses expected for 23. And so, uh, whoop, one too far. So uh, as we look at uh, existing approved rate increases for 23, there's already uh, an approved rate increase of 4% for both water and wastewater for implementation on July 1, 2022. And uh, as a note, those rate increases remain adequate Though, as I mentioned, these inflationary cost pressures exceeded our original expectation, and the rate increases remain below those inflationary trends. And uh, continuing to sort of keep that 4% will, as I've talked about, require ongoing budget vigilance, particularly for those operating expenses, large capital projects affected by supply chain issues. 
and as I'll show on the next couple slides, that rates remain affordable compared to peers. And so here is an updated uh, water bill uh, calculation uh, for rates that would be effective 7-1-2022, so for the next fiscal year. And for many years, I'll note that East Bay Mud was at the top of this chart, uh, or, or in the top few, and in recent years, uh, we're now more in line with uh, the um, middle uh, tier here. And uh, you'll, uh, we'll note that of the ones that are marked DS, those are uh, including a drought surcharge. And many of these are proposed or include fiscal year 23 rates. Uh, one or two of them uh, include just the uh, July 1st, 2021 rates for prior year. And then for wastewater system, uh, here is the average bill comparison updated for fiscal year 23, so the rates as of 7-1-2022. We'll note that uh, with the other um, uh, uh, charges by other providers, uh, partner agencies for East Bay Mud, uh, we are near the top of the chart, but the East Bay Mud portion of the bill is less than half. And you'll see comparisons there. And most of these uh, are updated for the current fiscal year, though a few are uh, either proposed or uh, as of the last year. So do we know if uh, these other agencies also have these kind of extraneous charges from other local municipalities or others? Or we kind of, they don't. Most of them are single charge. Yeah. Well, and some of they don't all handle it via a bill either, right? Property and tax some of some. it comes on property taxes or other. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. We're going to move to water sales volumes for 22 and 23. We thought we would note this, that fiscal 22, the budgeted projection was 144.3. At this point, we're now projecting 142 million gallon per day average. Uh, by the end of the current year, reflecting some of the uh, same year savings uh, uh, compared to budget, though not compared to uh, sort of prior years. This is really just a budget versus actual projection. And for fiscal year 23, the budget included an expectation of, a, of an increase in usage, although our projection now is a decrease in usage to 135.6. That number is based on a 10% savings in build water sales uh, compared to calendar year 2020, which was 150.7 million gallons per day. So when the board has talked about a 10% mandatory savings, that is baked into the projections for revenue for fiscal 23. Sam, quick question. Um, and maybe Clifford will deal with this later. The governor's announcements yesterday, if he goes for a mandatory statewide reduction, I didn't, I read, I tried to read, but I couldn't find a percent he talked about. He, he didn't speak about a percent yesterday, but um, what he has talked about before was 15% um, voluntary um, across the state. So I imagine that he's going to stick with the 15%. What he heard yesterday um, was that even at the low of the last drought in 2015 across the state, a lot of agencies, because their baseline is 2020, uh, a lot of agencies would, even if they hit that target in 2015, that would still not be 15% um, because he's comparing the 2020 baseline versus a 2013 baseline. And so one of the concerns that we shared was um, wh you know, what baseline you choose. And what the state board talked about is maybe they should start considering moving away from a baseline and looking at a GPCD threshold instead because you know the baseline year always creates complications right. so 15 percent uh kind of the short answer is probably so, what he's so if it's 15 percent how does that change our projected revenue that's a great question uh probably would be about a 10 15 million dollar decrease compared uh you'll see this last uh, i'm estimating that based on the uh this decrease led to a 31.2 million uh, decrease in operating costs no longer covered by wa water revenues, basically lost revenue. So it'd be, I guess, a little bit higher than that because it's compared. But yeah, somewhere uh, uh, 15 or so million. And million. how would the, uh, I mean, it's not going to be 15 million, I know that, but the offset, if it's 15% versus 10%, decrease amount of electricity and chemicals because 
Hmm. That would also be, we're not going to use as much chemicals to treat and less electricity to pump. Okay, thank you. Great. So that leads on the water system in terms of what we budgeted for fiscal 23 compared to what we're now projecting. The, uh, this includes two changes. The one water charge decrease by 31.2, assuming that savings compared to the 2020 baseline. We don't expect any changes for SEC revenues or all other uh, revenue sources, and then drought surcharge would increase revenue if applied for the entire fiscal year 23 by 30.8 million. However, we see SEC revenues coming in well over the amount that we budget, and I get why. I, I get why we do that, um, but it seems like one of those things where we say, oh, well, but SEC will probably be higher, and so we'll be okay. I, I'm just wondering at what point. You know, if we have to go to 15% and there aren't enough in reserves to, you know, sort of cover that, whether, you know, moving the needle on SCC, if we think that construction is, you know, going to continue, um, whether there's some, you uh -huh. know, room there to well, adjust. It, it's a good question. Um, so, so one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that at this point, we're assuming that we're going to be covering all of the reduced revenue that we, you know, will get from the conservation that our customers will come through for us with using reserves. So in net, we're, you know, we're planning for a decrease essentially in our reserves. So if we get more SECs, it just means a lower decrease in our reserves. No, but I mean, if we have to go up to 15%. Oh, yes, yes. That's then correct. is there still enough in reserves? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, right. Between, we're not going to plan on SECs coming in. We've tried really hard as a team to be conservative around our budgeting around that and not not, you know, laying our eggs there. But, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we've had strong, strong SEC revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, development looks like it, it isn't going to be slowing down because we just, we're going to be getting into this in, in, after the break. But there, there's, you know, ha there's a housing shortage in the state. So. Yeah, which, I mean, sort of does make me wonder whether our conservative assumptions about SEC color our decisions in a way that ends up being not you know mm -hmm. productive over the long over the long term which either would imply reducing our SCC charges or baking in a higher level that's based on you know good solid understanding of what's going on in in the market that then allows us to you know deal with other costs and charges in a way to our customers, but also to our spending decisions, you know, that. Well, um, what about, uh, you know, we're going to be coming back to you in about, you know, eight or nine months kind of as we go into the budget process. And so we can do some work on looking at kind of what's happened over time and then make decisions together about what's an appropriate number to put in into the, the next year's. Any other questions on water revenue projections? So we're into wastewater revenue projections here. Uh, the only uh, expected change or um, projection projected change here is uh, treatment charges and permits. It's often called. Uh, we're expecting a three million dollar decrease uh, compared to what was budgeted, and this is because of lower water use leads to lower uh, build charges for wastewater as well. And so, but no other changes expected there, although similar discussion about uh, coming back to the board on capacity charges also influenced by development. And so that is into the break. So there's nothing else on the mid-cycle budget side until we come, uh, we want to still take a break. So, so we have 12 more slides in about 25 minutes. So if it's okay with the board, maybe we can just continue to move through the Workshop. I'll turn it over to Richard Liu. 
Uh, good morning, Board of Directors. I'm Richard Liu. I work in the finance group primarily on rates and charges, and I'm going to give you a brief update, very brief update on the rates and charges proposed for FY23. As Sam pointed out, we have a two-year budget cycle, and we're proposing to reaffirm the budget. Uh, similarly, we have a two-year cycle on the rates for the Prop 218 rates, so we're not going to be discussing the regular treatment water water rates right now because those are already adopted for FY23. Uh, but we will be talking about the non-Prop 218 rates, and we do update those on an annual basis. So first, I'll just cover the SEC charges. That's you know we talked a little bit about those just now. We, uh, if you recall, last year we did an extensive update to our SEC with a study detailed study that updated our methodology and uh, the way we calculate the rate. That resulted in about 30% decrease in our SEC fees, so that's reflected in the estimate for the revenues, but as has been pointed out, the development patterns have really stuck with us, so we're bringing in more money. But when we're updating those uh, every year, we look at the inflation for the facilities that we have, the added depreciation as the uh, existing facilities age, additions, how much cash, how much uh, debt we have outstanding on these, these assets, and we recalculate the SCC every year. And so the resulting SCC, which we'll have some more slides later, I'll show you more details, the increase for FY23 will be about 2.2 to 4.6% from the last year's rates. Uh, similarly, we do an update for the wastewater capacity fee. That study was uh, updated in 2019, so we're following the information in that study. Again, we're updating for inflation, addition, and depreciation of those assets. And uh, because there's a fewer rates there, I just gave the summary here. The increase will be about 3.3% to 3.8% for FY compared to the FY23 rates. And for example, for the single family uh, wastewater capacity fee, it'll increase 3.5% to 29.50 for per connection. And all these rates will be effective July 1st, 2022. So all the prop Prop 218 and the prop, a non-Prop 218 rates will be July 1st, 2022. So let me just quickly show you the SCC rates. Uh, again, if you recall, we have three SC, we charge SCC by region because we have different facilities in different regions, uh, treatment, distribution, uh, pumping plants. Uh, we, we call them east of hills, west of hills, and then region two is the hills portion. So for SCC, for single family customers, again, the SCC is based on what our expected water use is. And this was updated in this last study to reflect our demand study that we just recently completed. And as you can see, the updated proposed changes for FY23 are shown in blue, ranging from 3.1 to 4.5% increase. Again, we used to have put a lot of emphasis on single family uh, development and the SCC rates, but as you, we've seen recently, most of our SCC on the residential side is multifamily. And so that's what we have here in the multifamily section. Multifamily customers use less water than single family customers because usually there's very little irrigation. And so we have two categories that we created for multifamily in the last SCC study, uh, the standard size and then one for dwelling units 500 square feet and less, so that, which showed less water usage. Again, so those, those are varying uh, about 3.2 to 4.6% increase for FY23, and you can see the, the proposed rates there. Just to cover all the bases for non-residential meters, again, we base off the average consumption that we see in the regions for the smallest size meter, and those are also increasing between 3.1 and 4.6%. Uh, so that covers the SCC and wastewater capacity fees. That, sure. For a minute. No so I, I seem to recall that this was, the SCC was originally a concept to pay for something going forward. And I, we keep raising this, and I keep hearing from all kinds of folks, golly gee, we're part of the problem of why homes are so expensive. And for a while there, we did a freeze, but now we're back at it again. And I, I'm not, I'm not real comfortable with the idea that we're contributing uh, to the increased cost of houses. 
and I see the SEC rates as being a, a, a major problem in that. Um, so uh, we did have a decrease of about 30 percent less last year, and so I think you know we got some really positive comments when we came to you last year from the development community, mm -hmm. and so we're we were glad to be able to justify that. Now, in terms of is the SEC for for things going forward. Um, Really, most of our SEC is a reimbursement to our customers for the investment that they um, have made um, in facilities so that we can serve new development. Um, that's the, the bulk of kind of those costs. And, and um, you, you know, if you, if you sort of look at, you know, what is it that's affecting, you know, housing prices, land prices have gone up, labor prices have gone up, material prices have gone up. So I would say those are the three drivers for, for what the increases are. Um, there has been you know, um, a lot of media, and there was a study that came from the Turner Center at UC Berkeley that's gotten a lot of press about, you know, SECs now in California, um, you know, representing, um, you know, I can't remember the number, you know, you know, 50 or 70 or something like that, $1,000, mm -hmm. um, you know, for a home. Uh, I think, you, you know, this is all sort of like a function of how in California we pay for, for infrastructure and you know, school districts that, uh, you know, have limited funding and so are looking to get, uh, the cities are looking to get, you know, SCC funds to essentially help build infrastructure around parks and things like that, that, that you know, they're able to um, put in place to serve families and, and so on. But, um, you know, when we, when we you know, we, we felt really good about our SCC study last year and, um, you know, the fact that we were able to to really say, you know, hey, when we look at the decreases in water usage that we've achieved as a result of our strong conservation programs, we can justify reducing our SEC to say those joining our communities today um, are building homes that are, you know, essentially using less water than they, they ever have. And so we're reflecting that in our SEC. Sophia? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is the first time I've ever heard it classified as this is a reimbursement back to our customers. I've always been under the understanding that the SEC was designed for um, projects we needed. That's how our Freeport project was built to a large extent on the SEC funds that we collected. That's where we purchased water in the past for water uh, from whether it be Placer or Yuba or whomever. But it's I've always understood it. It's to so that our current customers are not going to pay for the new development, one. So we can argue that somebody can say, well, it's costing me money. Who's currently here? No, it's not. They're paying for it. And it's paying for the infrastructure <clears throat> and water supply that will be needed for the future, not as a reimbursement back to the customers who had uh, already in the system. So it's, when, when did both. that change? It's both. It's, it's, it's had both components for decades. And... Um, the idea being that, you know, uh, Party <coughs> Reservoir, you know, can, ha, when it was built 100 years ago, had mm. capacity to serve more than, you know, the small community of folks right. that, that were living there. But going back a long ways, our, uh, our SEC has included a component that says, um, you know, when we build, we try to kind of look to the future right. um, and make sure that we're being responsible and that we're not building something very small. There was a, actually a bill that... Um, you know, uh, we, we were asked to review uh, by Marlene's team recently that was looking to kind of potentially change how SECs can be charged. And one of the comments that we made was, this is going to, you know, ask us to be more reactive and basically say, let's not think to the future because we're not going to be able to recoup those costs. So we'll just build something very small. And then if somebody else wants to come along, we're going to have to build a whole new thing for them. And that's going to be way more expensive than the increment if we had been able to, you know, think for the future. Now, I understand the, the one word was reimbursement yeah. or two words, reimbursement back. Mm -hmm. That's what caught my attention. Yeah. I, again, I've never heard it classified that way. And all the presentations I've made, I've always talked about the SEC is to help fund future projects and water needs so that our current customers are not being, it's not being put on their shoulders but to a large extent, it's being put on the shoulders of those who are coming into our service area. Yeah, and, th and there are both components um, of future water supply and um, of uh, the existing backbone of the system that has capacity to serve uh, new customers. And, um, and all of that is covered you know, through our water supply you know, master plan and, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So we, we make sure that we're always you know, making investments so that we're going to be here to make sure that we can grow um, as our community grows.
And maybe you've heard differently as maybe as a, a buy-in cost. Buy-in, yeah. That that we've used before. I've heard, I've heard buy-in. Yeah, yeah. So and so I, I think is, that's the same. That's, that's the what, same that's what concept. The buy is. But buy-in to me is not reimbursement back. Okay, um, that's fair. I can see that. <laughs> but you know, okay, I'm sorry. But one of the things you look at our water demand and how we've gone from 1994 to where we are today. We're down about, what, maybe 30 million gallons a day on the demand? And so what are we buying in? The infrastructure. The infrastructure, all well, of the infrastructure. I, I, but, okay, the infrastructure. And, and that's and the 30%, I mean, you know, that we were able to kind of come back with with respect to the SEC is reflective of exactly the dynamic that you're, you're talking about, Director Bell. Okay. okay. Question, yeah. uh, a little more specific, uh, what, why is uh, Region 1 increasing at a higher rate than the other regions? The 4.5%, 3.1%, actually, I'm not sure. Um, do you know? I, yeah. I, so, I don't remember. I thought the study initially said Region 1 it was an older system, so more money was being invested into Region 1 because the system was so much older than other parts of the service area. Well, it's not older than the health than the east. That's yeah. Well, it is. I mean, region one is the oldest section, yes. One uh, is yeah, the so, oldest so section. When we update these, we update for every different component. So, uh, escalation of the prices uh, for the inflation for them, and also depreciation, and also uh, addition. So it's a it's a mishmash of all those calculations. So it depends on how the the, the numbers uh, interact with each other on that. But. The, the, I mean, the question I have, is, it's really, is this change fundamentally because of, in, you know, things that have happened that weren't baked in, in the, you know, uh, when we did the um, projections for these coming years, or, um, I mean, it does seem to me that, I mean, I have a, I have a lot of, <laughs> this isn't the system capacity charge study. So, um, you know, whether there's, uh, you know, we're basing this on gallons per day used. Yeah, that, that has not changed. Right. Um, and so there's, but there's a component of, of it that is about how much water people use. And right. there's a component of it that is about what it takes to get that water to people regardless of how much they use, which has been the justification for why we have a fixed charge and a variable charge. And um, for those who use less water, the fixed charge is a, a much larger component of their water bill than the variable charge. Correct. By, I don't know, two to three times for me. Right, it, it's that much larger because I don't use very much water, and so my flow charge is, you know, twelve dollars a month. So it's fifty percent high for my fixed charge is fifty percent higher than my variable charge. Um, so I just wonder, you know, we, we state that it's about gallons per day, but that's not really what the chart. You know, I don't know if you can, if it can get more granular. That for us to under and for our customers who might be reading this, not that any of them will, um, to understand what part of it's related to how much water people use and what part of it is related to the underlying infrastructure, um, you know, buy in, meaning, and I've always understood it to be the system that we've constructed that gets people water plus Correct. what it takes to provide water to new people in uh, in our service area. Um, okay, so there's the rates and charges piece, and you're right, so on the rates, on our operating costs and, you know, the replacement of our, you know, pipes and, you know, so on and so forth, we have our fixed costs um, that we're charging and the variable cost. And really, I mean, you know, as we've said before, 90% of our costs are fixed, but we don't we don't make our the fixed portion of our charge 90%. We you know have uh, kind of committed to no more than a third coming from from a fixed portion of the charge, and then we have a, a piece that we're collecting on the variable side. So then on the SEC side, 
Um, the idea is when a home joins uh, the, the district, um, is built, we're, we're, we have one opportunity to say, you're buying into our system and um, you know um, we in, we invested all of this uh, so that you could be here, and and that includes the the things that we need to build um, for the future that Director Coleman mentioned, and the things that we have been investing in all these years to make sure that we're ready, so that we're ready. We're not going to be the, the the folks that slow down um, essentially growth in our area because we are prepared. All our water supply planning folks are always looking out there, working with the cities to make sure that we're all in concert. So. Um, when that home comes, what we look to say is, you know, of course, every home is going to be slightly different, and, and it would be very, very expensive and complicated to do a site-by-site -site calculation, and the reality is when a new family moves into that home in 10 years, their usage is going to be different than the family before, their gardening practices are going to be different, et cetera. And so we just have this one opportunity, and so it's very standard practice in the, the FCC world to essentially um, take an average uh, gallon per day or an average amount of usage that we assume that that family is going to use. So now we made some reductions, um, you know, last year that we adopted, and so that um, reduced the overall SEC for, for our customers, essentially, and for, for the developers in, in our area. And so that was reflective um, of all of that. Now, just as a reminder, um, you know, we don't have to charge anything for an SEC. It just means rates could be higher. So we could have, you know, um, the, the amount that, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, recovering um, from, from our SCCs every year, $30 million, $40 million, we could add that to the rate base and just have higher rates and have no capacity fee. So this is, you know, this is all, uh, uh, you know, uh, a net, net sum zero game, as it were. And so what we're as staff always looking to do is to make sure that we're bringing you the latest information about, um, you know, if we really want people to buy into the, the assets that we've uh, constructed so that development can be here, then this is a fair charge for, for what that looks at, like. And, and we reduced it because, you know, we know that people are using less water than they used to. And so, so that's, that's a reality. Yeah. So, so would it be helpful for the board before June 14th? I mean, we can resurrect at least a portion of when we talk about the SECs, how we do the calculation, the, some of the philosophical issues that were shared with the board back of, you know, here are the different ways you can or just not charge at all that we share with the board. We can resurrect that so that you can see what goes in the calculation, just as a memo, um, and, and what's driving, you know, the increases that we're proposing right now. Yeah, it still, still doesn't answer Andy's basic question, though, which is what, what's, what are these, why are these, why is it so much more? Richard, go ahead. Yeah, for, for one, for Region 1 um, compared to 2 and, and 3? I think we've best, best answered in a memo, as Clifford suggests. We do have the detailed calculations and tables in the, in the GM report. I'll go through those in more detail and pull out the salient points that can answer the question for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just, just as a summary, just to, just to give you a little bit more perspective on this is that uh, as Sophia pointed out, there's lots of different ways to do our rates and charges and our, our SECs. Uh, one of the primary things that we have to remember as a water district and as, as a group setting the rates and charges in finance is that we are providing a service to customers. We're not, I mean, we say we're selling water, but we're really providing service to customers. So when they turn on the tap, the water comes out whenever they want it, and they can use as much as they except during the drought, as much as they, 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 they want in, in, this, uh, in a reasonable amount. So when we design our rates and charges, we have to do a bunch of different calculations and assessments and allocation of cost. And in some instances, uh, the, the, the charges may not seem, uh, w without, without a little, little bit of perspective, may not seem to make sense. But I think uh, based on our philosophies, as Clifford pointed out, we can put that together a memo that describes the SEC maybe in a, in a different way that might provide some insight to you. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, whoops. So in addition to SECs, we do charge some, oh, the, the other comment I wanted to make is a, just a, is a preview in terms of the cost of the SEC to housing. I think uh, obviously the price of housing is very, very expensive in the Bay Area. I think our perspective is that the, the SCC, the, 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 the problem with housing is a shortage of supply, and the SCC is probably not the biggest contributor to the source of uh, the difficulty in getting the supply, but there are other, obviously, a lot of other uh, challenges in building 
housing in the Bay Area. And uh, one of those things in terms of the, uh, the East Bay mud that we're gonna do, we're gonna describe how we can get our projects out faster, uh, installations for the developers that, that need them be, uh, in this uh, critical time crunch. So with that, uh, like I said, there are other non-Prop 218 charges that we have. These are pretty small, but many customers do pay them. Uh, Schedule B is account establishment charges. And these are all increasing by about two to 3% for cost of living adjustments and other uh, increases that we have in cost. Uh, we also have some special services such as the uh, meter testing and the hydrant meters and things like that in Schedule C. And then we do have the installation charges, which I believe I think are going up by one to two to 3%. And then again, uh, we're going to have a little presentation at the very end here to talk about how we're going to try to get those projects moving faster. Uh, the Public Records Act, uh, if someone asks to get public records, we have a charge that we do to just for our, our, our cost for copying and preparing the materials. There's a few changes in the recreation use fees in the Comanche recreation area for the boating and mooring. Those are pretty standard increases uh, for that reflect the cost and the other, uh, what others are charging in this area. We have uh, just a couple water service regulations changes. I think I have a slide on that. And on the wastewater side, there's a interceptor connection review charge that uh, when other communities wanna hook up to our connect, uh, interceptors, we, we have a review and, and an inspection charge. Oops, doing the wrong one. Oh, so, so here I have the details. I guess I got a little lost there when we talked about the SEC. So, so the, the count assessment charges and the property use charges, they're all going to increase between 1% and 7%. There's one or two weird ones that are, that are making that higher. Again, we have the recreation fees going about 9 to 15%. And as I said, the installation charges are going up between 1% and 4%. Uh, these are the three regulations that are changing. They're real minor wording changes. Uh, there's something that describes what a standard service is. Uh, there's another one, section four, that describes our main extensions and we're just clarifying how we're using our en engineering standard practices to make those determinations of how to size the mains because there have been some questions about those. And then on our discontinuation of service, we have a, a, for our non-residential accounts because that's something that we will still be continue to do in the future. Uh, just describing how we contact the customers and let them know that there's going to be a discontinuation of service. And with that, I believe uh, this is just a summary of what's the steps that are happening right now. We're having our workshop. We will be holding a public hearing on rates and charges on the 14th to discuss the non-Prop 218 charges that's been announced uh, in the newspaper. So there are, we will have to hold a public hearing and then we will the board will consider adoption of those rates on the same board meeting. And all the rates and charges that are approved for FY23 will take place on July 1st. If there are any, no other questions, I'm gonna turn this over to Sophia. She can describe the next thing. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Um, so we did want to, as a senior management team, come to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, the fact that, you know, you've all brought up that addressing California's uh, housing shortage is a critical need. So there are new laws that have been focused on trying to increase the number of homes that are being built in our communities, uh, the regional housing needs allocation goals, and Plan Bay Area has um, identified a need for an additional 1.4 million housing units, um, including 463,000 units in uh, Contra Costa and Alameda counties. Um, you know, both of which we serve. So these cities and counties are, are, are really looking to, you know, all of us public agencies to expedite projects so that we can uh, remain in compliance um, and avoid fines and obviously just make sure that we're getting homes out there as fast as possible. And um, uh, of course, work does include um, cities and counties updating their housing element um, and, and zoning plans, et cetera. So when we look at this, um, uh, essentially the, the goal of the regional housing needs allocation and, and the impact on the district, um, you know, we have been experiencing uh, project peak workloads with the increased development, um, more accessory dwelling units, infill projects, which require main extensions um, and, and sometimes other infrastructure upgrades as well. 
Um, there are also much higher density projects. Um, some of them are low-income housing projects. And then, you know, large developments, which can require pretty significant infrastructure. And so there's an ongoing pressure to kind of really push forward with these projects in order for the cities and goal, uh, counties to be able to, you know, maintain compliance. So when, when we, as the district and as the senior management team, have been looking at alternatives um, for meeting the, uh, the peak applicant uh, project workload, um, one, we, we, when we come back to you next year with the next budget, uh, we may require some new rates and charges to be able to support um, making sure that we're ready and can you know, hit, hit the ground running um, for being able to actually physically connect, essentially. So this is separate from the FCC. This is about physically connecting um, to our system. Go ahead, Director Mellon. Back on the accessory dwelling units. Yes. Are we experiencing additional meters being put in for those ADUs? Or are they just simply, what are we dealing with? It depends on the circumstances, Andrew. I don't know if you'd like to come up and talk a little bit about it, but it depends um, a little bit on, on each individual ADU. Because, because I've, you know, I've had folks call me from time to time, and I've said, why do you need a meter when you can just tap it off your house? And I think it's because they're planning on letting the ADU occupants pay for it. Well, you're right in terms of every project is unique, and we look at every indiv you know, uh, application individually. In some cases where the existing meter can accommodate the addition, like how, depending on how it's built out, if it's built within the existing building envelope, and they can accommodate by the existing meter, we will not even require a review and would not require any additional meters. But in some cases where it's like an individual structure, like completely built independently and outside the existing envelope, those would require review, and but in some cases that even though um, they add a building, but they can be accommodated by the existing meter, we wouldn't require a new meter. So it's all case by case, so we do look at it carefully. It's only when the time that the additional capacity exceeded the uh, the existing meter, that's when we look at, at hey, Actually, the base of my question was, are we experiencing more meter requests because of the ADUs? we are seeing more applications for ADUs for review. Okay, thank you. So um, we are looking at alternatives um, internally to accelerate the timeline that it takes to complete our application projects. And, and some of the alternatives um, that we're gonna be looking at are utilizing more LT positions, contracting um, design services, allowing the applicant to design portions um, with district review and approval or a combination of alternatives above and others for consideration. So these are all the things that we're gonna be looking at to understand how can we make sure that when it comes time to connect that you know these buildings aren't waiting months essentially to get that connection. Go ahead. Um, yeah, one of the issues that's come up um, from customers to me on this topic um, it, and explanations that we've gotten back is that you know, when the design is done by the um, applicant, they don't do it right, and so they have to come back for redesign. So I'm not sure how having the having the applicant uh, do the design necessarily helps expedite things. When in fact, what I've heard, at least on a couple of occasions, is that you know, uh, well, what happens in construction is that somebody else, not the water people, but PG&E or, or whatever other utilities are going in, don't follow, and we don't have control over this, we come in last, and uh, you know, other people haven't followed the plans, and so a redesign has to happen. Um, yeah. Yes, which is why we're showing you just various options. One, we can contract those services ourselves, and we have more control over making sure they meet the standards. We've had the issues where a contract designer doesn't follow the standards, so it actually slows the project down. And so if we were to go down that path, we would have to provide greater clarity to whoever their designer is on what the expectations are when they give us a design packet. So we're just exploring and just sharing with you different options. We understand some of the drawbacks of some of these. Right. So it might be a suite of, of possibilities that could be deployed in situation, exactly. on a situational basis. Right. Exactly, which is why we're sharing with you that this is probably going to be a combination of these. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Director Coleman. I've raised, this, I've raised this a number of times with Clifford. 
and and I appreciate what he's looking at trying to do and being creative. Having worked for a developer over a decade ago, I can understand that time is money, which goes into the factor of increased cost of housing. But when we have developments, especially some infill, primarily infill now, we don't have much greenfield anymore being done. Uh, that gets delayed, and then we get pressures from the city because I get the phone calls from the mayor of a city saying we have to meet these numbers or we're going to be fined. And so I appreciate the creativity that's being looked at, and I would hope when the discussions happen with the union leadership that they will understand this. I mean, we need to obviously do as much as we can in-house. I'm not discounting that at all. But at the same time, we need to be creative. Otherwise, we're going to be slowing down and being criticized at some point in the future by uh, local government, which will feed its way to Sacramento, which could add undue pressure on our operations going forward if we aren't trying to be creative. Thank you. So with that, um, uh, we're, we're at the point now where we've, we've brought to you our proposed mid-cycle budget, um, and that includes some position adjustments, as we've discussed. Um, you know, most of those positions are for ODEC, appropriately given kind of the direction that we've taken um, over the course of the last um, 18 months since we developed the last budget. Um, we have brought to you our, our proposed drought budget um, and the staffing for that drought budget as well. And that's all included in the in the mid cycle. And then we um, also reviewed changes to the KPIs uh, and um, and received some feedback from Director Coleman. Uh, and we also uh, reviewed some changes to our non 218 rates and charges. Um, and um, there are some follow up items there. So our next action would be on June the 14th, which is a request to affirm our FY23 budget and um, amend, uh, amend that to add our drought contingency budget. And um, we would also at that time be requesting that you approve the changes to the staffing plan that we have proposed. And, um, and then we would be holding at that point a public hearing for an action on our non-218 rates. Yes, Director Coleman. Yeah, um, sort of teen off what Frank had said. Sorry, Frank, keep bringing you into this. Um, are you reaching out to the development community as well as the NGO community that does housing for uh, the nonprofit community to make sure that they're aware of this and so that they're not caught off guard uh, if and when this is approved come July 1. Um, and we have a lot of NGOs that Habitat for Humanity and such forth to build housing as well as the development community. Just it may make it easier for everybody up here and you if the outreach happens sooner than the June 14th meeting when the decision is being made so everybody is, knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. there, there is a list um, that Risha has of certain um, housing entities that have asked to be in, informed of rate changes, but we don't have kind of a general list and that's an interesting suggestion and we can follow through on that. Thank you. I have one more question. One more question going back to the uh, slide 53. Um, or really just a, a comment. So I, I have recently in, in, interacted with an applicant for uh, not housing, but for another um, connection, another service connection in my ward. And, uh, you know, learned through, through, you know, exchange with staff that our process really does take about four to six months just to get connected. And uh, this is particularly challenging for uh, the, this business person who is trying to, you know, have a, have a nice business launch and, uh, you know, it does. It does seem like we should be exploring uh, beyond limited term enhancements to the new business office, um, because it does seem like that's. Um, it, it's a delay that may be able to work for for some housing. Although, if if it's, uh, a, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. It could be very very challenging, even for a housing developer if they are uh, not familiar with what needs to be uh, initiated four to six months before they intend to open. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to comment uh, that, that the, the list of options should include uh, not just LT positions, but permanent, permanent positions. Um, if we can project that we're going to have adequate staff turnover um, in case we don't have um, projections, um, uh, development projections that, that continue, and, and we should look at the development climate um, because I do expect that we will um, have very high housing demand and um, a lot of local governments have uh, enhanced the 
um, project opportunities for developers to um, make uh, applications, uh, I think, beyond uh, uh, this year. I think, I think this peak will, will continue. Yes, and just quickly on that one too, I mean, one of the things that's not listed here that you know, Andrew's staff is working on is working with the cities to let them know that, you know, let us know early in the process. I think in your particular instance, the developer had finished, practically finished all of their construction and then comes to us and says, we need a connection. You know, and, but if they came to us six months ago when they started construction, they would have been in the queue. So part of that work that Andrew's doing is outreaching the cities that when they come for the building permit to let them know, come to East Bay Mud too, and then we can get them in the queue, as opposed to they don't know the timelines. Um, it's already there with the cities, we just wanna amplify that some more. So I, I think it's gonna be a, a lot of different things that we're working on and what we're proposing to address this issue is that we don't get perceived or become the, the bottleneck. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, I mean, do we provide the cities with something that they kind of staple to the permit? We do. We do, okay. So. It, there's a lot, I mean, I've gone through the building permit process before and there's, you know, stacks of, you know, stuff that isn't, you know, you go, I'll, I'll look at this later, yeah. right, but so how we can, you know, raise the visibility of, you know. Yeah. We, we definitely do a lot of outreach to cities, planning department, building departments, whoever's, you know, have jurisdiction over, you know, construction. So we do all of that and, and get back to the question about outreach to the NGOs and, and development community. We do also um, mail and email them every time when we do a rate hearing about on the SEC and the uh, non Prop 218 rates. We do give them notification um, every year, and uh, we because we keep a um, kind of a, a inventory of all the people we work with over time in in the new business office. So are we, Andrew, are we looking ahead at all with what the cities are approving? versus who we've worked with in the past, because it could be new people coming into our arena who have not worked with us, so they may not be receiving that information. That is true. I mean, most of our list of emails are from past clients, but a lot of them are, you know, they do do a lot of repeat work in Sure, in I, I understand area. that, but. Yeah, okay. I mean, the people we're gonna hear from are the individuals, especially in the ADU case where somebody's bringing, you know, putting an ADU in their I think our biggest partner in this is really the city's planning department and the building department, really to try to get the word out. And we're doing absolutely everything we can to engage them. All right, any questions, further discussion by board members? If not, we'll uh, go to public comment after presentation. Do we have uh, anyone on the line who would like to comment on What's been heard? I don't have anybody on the line for public comment. All right. Uh, I would just like to say that I, I like the, the, the presentation uh, and, and the discussion and the emphasis on uh, coordination on the housing issue. I think it's a, it's a big problem. We all know uh, I deal with it a lot in terms of uh, work I do with candidates who are asked about this all the time. What are they going to do in their communities about uh, the homeless situation? Uh, and we know that's a, a multi-layered problem, but certainly housing uh, and housing supply is a significant part of it uh, and uh, a significant part of the uh, housing supply issue is the costs and the location and all that. And I think, uh, as I've always said, you know, if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. Uh, here and I like to see that we're really working towards being part of the solution. So thank you for that. Uh, I, join, I join with you on that because I think the housing situation is critical. Um, what we have now is the gentrification has gone so far ahead of uh, the people. We have people who are really not represented. They didn't get into the census or anything, and they're now getting assistance toward getting into uh, housing that is recognized, that makes them full-fledged uh, citizens, so to speak. I mean, they're, they're citizens, but not recognized. And the impact of that 
lies squarely on everybody who has any input into that. And certainly, uh, we don't want to be the drag. And uh, I wanted just to comment on John's uh, comments that he made. In the past, it's been very evident that the contractors didn't throw us in the queue early. Uh, and they didn't press us into the queue. In many of the cases that come to our attention, at least to my attention, are for lack of them having been up front, and suddenly they have a large amount of money they have to pay. And, and they're just running around, you know, eye-popping uh, at what happened to them. So they need to be in the queue early they need to have that information and secure funding in some cases so that they can pay us when they come in. Uh, I just wanted to join with you, Mr. President, to say that's an important thing. And it's really one of the, this is a pandemic uh, it, all over. It's not just here, but all over the nation, they're, backed up with this because the homelessness problem is really the number one problem. And next to COVID, that's it. And they're right together. Anyway, I wanted to say that. Thank you, Bill. Uh, with that then, let's, uh, uh, this workshop is now adjourned uh, and we will convene for the 11 a.m. <laughs> now 11, 16 a.m. Uh, closed session meeting.